Hello, this is James Berger, and we're back with Off the Press. And again, our guest today is Attorney Bobby Cloud, um, and uh, he's running for the f Ward 6 uh, Bakersfield City Council seat uh, against uh, Jackie Sullivan. And uh, my host, co-hosts today, of course, are Russell Johnson uh, and Nicole Parra. Russell has been a city council member, and he knows what he's talking about on that <laughs> score. And then uh, and Nicole has been in the assembly, so... I don't uh, know what I'm talking about. You do, <laughs> uh, just on a different uh, sacramental sort of way. Um, uh, so, uh, Bobby, uh, I, I covered the city council for six years, back okay. before I had started doing the, ca the, the county. And I covered a couple of races uh, for people running against uh, Jackie Sullivan. It's an interesting uh, endeavor you've entered into. Uh, she's oh, yes, it is. Yes, and it I is. did not realize how interesting it was mm -hmm. until I started. Okay. But, well, let's talk about that because um, why did you run for Ward 6? Is it just because you live there? Well, actually, I was living in Ward 2 and I was selling my house because my son moved away. So I was ah. trying to sell my house and that's where I was moving to was Ward 6. Okay. So I figured, you know, I wanted to run for city council. I was going to be living in the area and give it a shot. It wasn't. It wasn't a direct attack at Jackie Sullivan. Okay, if that's, you, if that's, 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 that's an what you're That's an interesting point. So, uh, so the your motivation to run was was because you, it's something you wanted to do. Yeah, to help out. Right. I mean, I have. There's a certain. It's always been that attorneys are supposed to take whatever skill set they have and to be able to help people, either by pro bono cases or by volunteering their time. Um, I do enough pro bono cases either on purpose or on accident by someone not paying the bill. Um, I would rather, instead of just adding something to my workload, use up some of my time that I have that's free. And if I can do that through city council and be able to make a positive impact, um, I'm happy to do it. All right. Well, let's, let's assume that I believe that I'll be happy to do it. Mm -hmm. With what I've learned in the past couple of weeks, I may be miserable the entire time. I don't know. It, it is a challenge, and Russell can speak to, to that right. more than I. Yeah. Uh, I was always amused to cover the city, but I didn't have to sit in that seat. So, You know, it, it's an interesting role. I find that um, on the most part, you know, council members dedicate a lot of time. They're there because they really have a heart for the community, and, you know, it's 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 you've been pretty candid with us in the interview you're actually a very candid upfront guy so i think that's going to be for some voters they're going to be they're going to appreciate that because you're up front and they know where you're coming from and you kind of don't hold it back which is good and it's kind of rare mm -hmm. in politics sometimes people <laughs> hold things back but um i i will say that um as you're you're looking at the city council it's it takes you know that commitment and you know sometimes people have been there a long time like jackie and she served a, a long career and um, you know, at some point, you gotta. Uh, the voters are going to be faced with the question, which is, do we need new leadership in Ward Six? And um, I think the biggest question is, is how? What do you think you bring to the table that Jackie Sullivan doesn't? Well, I have a fresh pers perspective. I think that the city council has a tendency as a whole to get locked up. Um, decisions that I think should be made in a much shorter period of time seem to be drug out and cost a lot more money. Time is money in what I do. Um, and divorces take longer than they should. I absolutely know that. And believe me, my clients remind me on a daily basis, basis. But some of the projects that we work on and decisions that need to be made get drug out so long it costs significant taxpayer money by dragging it out. Um, I think my attitude toward that is going to be I may come off as a nice guy. I can be extremely abrasive, and I'm not going to be popular with everybody, and I get that. But as a person, I'm a pretty mellow guy. I will tell you that there is definitely a different switch in a courtroom. I come in. I want to be reasonable. We either do it or we don't. If we don't, I'm not going to be nice. I'm like, I tell my clients I'm like a dog on a leash, and if I get into a situation where I feel like it's being stalled, I will, I will rattle the pans. I will make a bunch of noise that we're, and I will let the media and everyone else know and make sure everyone knows that I think that we are throwing money out a window. That's my money. That's your money. That's everybody's money that we're throwing out a window because we have a group that's not willing to make a decision, even if they have the information. So let's, let's talk about an issue that's kind of 
been in the news. It's been a big deal. I think it's a, probably a really big deal in the Ward 2 race, which is these uh, trip projects and the completion of the trip projects, namely 24th Street, Centennial Corridor, the last two big projects that are kind of on the burner right now. Um, so what, do you, what is your stance on the trip projects, and have you thought about that, and would you characterize that as one of those projects that's taken too long? Yes. Um, I have had some discussions with people that know about it. I know um, there's been my understanding. I don't have access to all of the information, but I've been trying to catch up. It's a lot more complicated running for this than I had expected. There's a lot more issues that people are very upset about on both sides um, than I ever expected. This is one of them. My understanding is that there's money being diverted um, to the trip projects that's making money come out of the general fund, which is not okay with me. I don't think that if there's money earmarked, it should be used as it's supposed to be used. Um, if these projects are going to happen, make them happen or drop them from calendar. I mean, either you're going to do it or you don't. Um, the idea of going back and forth and dragging it out, you have seven people, it's an odd number. Everybody shows up, you be educated on the subject, make sure everyone knows what we're talking about, make a vote, make a decision and move forward. Whether I'm for this or for that, I don't think matters. The important part is you make a decision and you get it done. Where you're going to put something needs to be decided. And going back and forth and everyone not having the willingness to make the hard decision. I mean, it goes back to what I do every day. Sometimes it takes months to make a good decision. you got to get the information. But once you make, have the information, the judge has to make a decision. And you just do it. So speaking of making a decision and... Um, the city council's looking at this food truck ordinance. It's kind of new. It wasn't on the, wasn't an issue I dealt with on the city council. It's kind of a new phenomenon. These food trucks are popping up, and they're. I have they're a distinct opinion on it. Perfect. Okay, here's the deal. Why are the brick and mortars upset for the hours that they're closed? The food truck issue downtown, especially, has nothing to do with the daytime hours, except for a few spots. And this ordinance is allowing that to happen, which is fine. But I don't think there should be any restriction on a food truck that's properly licensed and has a business license to be open near a brick and mortar building when they're closed. This does not give that caveat. Not to mention you're getting all of these, you have all of these alcohol serving businesses downtown and you're wanting to stop them from being able to serve food after one o'clock. Where are you gonna get food at one o'clock? You have to go to a fast food place that you have to drive to of the all the thing it's a reality i'm a big reality guy i don't think drinking and driving is a good idea i think it's a bad idea i think you should take an uber i think that you should take a cab i think that you should plan ahead um and i'll actually tell you since i am a straightforward guy about 13 years ago i got a dy i learned my lesson i don't do those things the idea of taking the food away from people that may be making a bad decision right before they get in a car is stupid Practically, it's stupid. Yes, drunk driving is bad. Nobody should be doing it. The reality is we wouldn't have any DUIs in this town if everybody agreed. People make mistakes. Don't take away one thing that may limit the chances of somebody running into somebody else at 2 o'clock in the morning because you're upset that someone's serving food next to a building that's closed. So so as councilman, you know, you get there and... It, would you go ahead and try to seek to redo this ordinance? Would you try to rewrite it, or would you just try to gut it, or, or just try to get get rid of it in general? I don't think the theory is wrong. I just think that the way that it's been tailored has been, it's tailored with a premise that somehow by stopping the food trucks when the brick and mortar businesses are closed and not serving food, somehow benefits the businesses of the brick and mortar. And I don't see that connection. It just doesn't make any sense. If you're closed and you're not going to make the money anyway, why stop the food truck from making the money? Because now the food truck isn't going to be able to keep somebody employed or a businessman running his business. And that person may end up going, forget about the safety issue, but the person goes home. If they don't run by Taco Bell, they didn't spend the money. And that's commerce leaving and heaven forbid they go to some chain restaurant where a portion of that money is going to go somewhere outside of town there's not any corporate food trucks that i'm aware of at this point so um but restaurants close around nine or ten downtown so what about the trucks that want to sell during the day 
Um, I think that you have an ordinance for that. They need to stay away from brick and mortar businesses. So I don't during the day hours, so they can open nine to two. Nine something. To two. Well, when the downtown the closes. Well, I, I think the regulation. They're still open at eight or nine at the I Padre or the Mark or seventy-five feet away right. from a brick and mortar right. building. Well, what's the current policy? I think it's seventy-five feet. Just seventy-five feet yeah. during the day yeah. or an evening. It's it's all, all the time. time. Open right. or closed. Right. So that's so you're my my to big. Less well, than 75. Well, no, I'm not even worried hours. about the number of feet. That's not right. the issue. The right. issue is, is it doesn't give a caveat. You you could park. If you're parked in front of a restaurant right. that's closed and nobody's inside, are you harming the restaurant by serving someone a burrito? Right. No. I don't know anyone who's ever right. got hurt by, you know, having a taco. Yeah, and it's successful in bigger cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco. You Absolutely. see them everywhere. And um, it works. So that's that's a you know a thought that I don't think was part of the debate uh, during these meetings. And I think my question to you is: It's obvious that you've got different thoughts and different uh, views on how you're going to approach these. How are you? How do you think you're going to view and how do you think you're going to approach the issue of public safety in our community? Because when you talk to most people, when I was a council member, that was the number one thing I got calls about was public safety. Um, wh what are your thoughts on how to deal with that issue? I think there's a deterioration of the relationship and respect for law enforcement mm -hmm. and the public. That that connection is being severed. It's being severed on a national scale, um, and I think that's the major root of our problem. If you look at all the actual statistics um, nationwide, things are actually getting better in the long run. There are certain areas that are spiking that are bad areas like Chicago. But locally, the issue is is we're being locally affected by people seeing what's going on uh, in the media and then having a bad attitude toward law enforcement. Well, there's a couple of things I think you can do about that. One, I'm a big fan of PAL. I think Police Activities League is amazing. I know a lot of kids that have had a positive experience, and they hold on to that because they've had a positive experience with an interaction with an officer. I think there should be PAL. Um, we should try to get as much PAL interaction as possible. We only ha I think we only have one in the east side. Mm -hmm. um, I think that needs to be focused in areas as a long-term solution, um, in areas that have higher crime. I think people that have a respect for officers are going to have less negative interactions when they do have an interaction with officers. Um, this is, doesn't make me popular necessarily, but I'm a big fan of body cams huge fan and everyone talks about how expensive they are but they don't think about the effect of not having them I used to do criminal work when I worked uh, for one of the main criminal attorneys in town and anytime you had for instance a CHP pullover and that CHP officer had a, a camera in the front of his car and the person gets out of their car for a DUI stop and they trip and they fall and you hear them slur do you know what they got no trial they took a plea for the DUI do you know what didn't happen? You didn't have a subpoena for the police officer to go to the trial and spend all day sitting down there and waiting. Maybe one day, maybe two days, maybe three days, that the city would be paying a police officer to be waiting to go to a trial that they wouldn't have had if they had video of it. The other thing that you don't have is you don't have these expensive investigations into officers doing the wrong thing. A common occurrence that I don't know if everyone realizes is so common, you get pulled over and you want to get out of your ticket or you want to get out of your DUI or whatever you did. Well, the officer touched me inappropriately. He punched me. He did this. Now you have to go through an investigation. That investigation has to, a lot of the time, take place before the criminal action goes forward. How much money do we spend? Now it's the cop's word against the word of someone who is being arrested. Now, do I think every cop is perfect? No, they're human beings. But if I had a video that was strapped to the front of that cop that he didn't touch the person, he didn't hit the person, how much time and money are we going to spend on that investigation? If we look at how much money we're going to save on the lack of investigations and the lack of police time and trials, maybe that will offset in the next two to three years the cost of getting video on our officers. Mm -hmm. Protects our officers from false allegations, and it protects the citizens that are accusing our officers of being brutal to them. It kills two birds with one stone and helps both sides. Mm -hmm. And it offsets a cost that it would cost. All four of us sitting here right now and probably almost everyone listening has a camera on them. Right. So, um, and I know we're going to run up into our next segment here shortly, right. but um, 
a lot of the debate this year has been focused on how we're going to fund additional police officers. Do we need additional police officers? What is your, how would you go in there and say, this priority is more important than that priority, and here's where we're going to get additional funds for officers, or do you think we have enough? Uh, we don't have enough. We just had a study a couple of years ago that says that we're horribly understaffed and where we should be. We're about like 100 officers short. That's bad. That's really bad because then you have a high-stress person who's in charge of the safety of other people with the authority to act with force against the citizens of the city. That's not good. And it's not even the officer's fault if they're overworked. I know when I'm overworked, I snap at people. If I worked a 12-hour day and did overtime, I would be more likely to you know, give a dirty word or something like that, and I'm not having physical interactions with people. So that doesn't make sense to me. I think there's a couple of things that we should do. One, let's set the ba I'm going somewhere, I promise, Russell. I'm not just rambling, I promise. Set the boundaries of the city and stop expanding, period. Figure out where they're going to be, put an end. Annex everything in the middle. Get rid of these islands. Use the additional taxes, and I know you have to convince those people, but I think when it's broke down, they'll understand that it's not gonna cost thousands of dollars. You use the additional taxes that are bringing from the annex, like because I just had a meeting with the um, Bakersfield Police Officers Association, and they go out there anyway. So we don't get any money from the county pockets. But when the call comes, the BPD that we're paying for goes out there and then realizes, hey, we're not in our jurisdiction. So we're gonna sit here for hours while a Kern County Sheriff drive through the city into the county pocket, and we're still spending all of that money on officers that are spending time there anyway. I say we annex the area, and instead of using, when we do the annex, use the money to create more officers as an offset and less other interaction. That way you use the money from the annex in order to increase the number of officers to build it up over a time period of 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that a lot of the county islands, though, are industrial or a lot of sales tax for the county. Uh, no, is it mostly residential? Not, yeah, there's actually a lot of residential pockets. A ton. A lot. Right. There's, there's some in Ward 7. Actually, and, well, that, and that is the problem. I mean, I, I started covering the city right as the uh, end of the annexation flap. Annexation uh, annies, yeah. Yes, the, the annexation yeah. annies. Who, uh, and the, the count, this, when uh, Alan Tandy first came to Bakersfield, he tried to do a big push mm -hmm. to annex uh, the pockets. And we are one of the most weird looking jurisdictions in the whole state, um, our city limits are. And uh, there's a lot of pushback, especially mm -hmm. from uh, people who are very tied to their identity as a county mm -hmm. uh, and non-city person, even if they are enveloped in four or five miles of city. Understood. But How much I mean would the county lose? Do you know that? Lose. You, you're the if they um, annex to the city. These well, are property county taxes. pockets, property taxes, uh, sales taxes. So that, I mean, I I'm appreciate your, your discussion, county but I'm just sort of thinking <laughs> that the county supervisors would not pretty much for uh, say no. Right. Uh, and so if that doesn't work, what do you think? Well, you know, Bakersfield isn't a, a self-help district either, city. No. And so, you know, taxation is something that the city residents don't necessarily vote for. So if the annexation doesn't work and you can't tax the citizens, how do you see yourself um, funding 100 new police officers? I mean, we ask all the candidates, we ask people, and it's nice to say these things. And it it's is nice, nice to be to able to say, this is what I'd like to do. But so one of these days, someone's going to have to say, we need to look at becoming a self-help city or self-help county. It's just going to have to happen. And how do you balance that? But again, every election season, uh, you know, people kind of run from that issue. So if it doesn't work out, is that something you would look at in the future? Well, when one thing doesn't work, you have to look at right. what, the, what is the next most logical argument. Right. And I will tell you, there's a lot of people who've been spending a lot more time on this than I have. Right. I'm, most of the ideas that you're going to come up with in my position, you're not going to come up with. Mm -hmm. There's someone who has been upset and thinking about this for the last five years sitting out there listening right now. Mm -hmm. That person's going to call and give you an idea. And right. maybe it's going to be a little nuts on one side, but it may have something of some serious value. Right. 
And that's what's gonna have to happen at the city and county level under this new normal of budget financing. You guys are gonna have to, whoever's on the board or the city council is well, gonna have to think outside of the box and think a little differently because the status quo cannot hold financially for our community. I totally understand and that's why we need to break the four, three <laughs> situation that we have, right. which I would do if I won and everything else stayed the same. Well, we and that's a perfect segue <laughs> to our ne our break, and we can come back. Mm -hmm. It'll uh, we will pick exactly that point up off when we're back as James Berger with Off the Press, and we'll be back in a moment. 